Hello out there, you optimistic oak trees. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Little Greener, a podcast all about nature, conservation, and sustainability. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Sarah, and I am joined, as always, by the wonderful Casey. How are you doing today, Casey? Hi, Sarah. I'm good. Um, I don't think it's the oak trees that's getting me right oh. now. I think it's <laughs> oh, no. the maples, the birches, etc. But if you notice, my voice is a little funky. I cannot breathe through my nose because of allergies right now. So I'm doing all right. Otherwise, how are you? <laughs> I am also doing okay. It's been a busy week for me. I'm usually a big homebody and I've been out sort of every day this week after work. Mm. So fancy. I, yeah, I'm good, but definitely looking forward to being home for the weekend for sure. Hey, we're recording the week of the eclipse. Yeah. How was your eclipse? Very low key. <laughs> where I was I don't think I ever even said and I I honestly will admit that at the time that we recorded that episode I didn't realize that everywhere across the country was getting at Something. least a little bit of eclipse I yeah I probably should have realized that but I didn't here I knew we were getting something and, and not much I think we were in the like 50 percent ish range of coverage okay. it was it, it was actually noticeable. I was surprised that I could even tell that there was just a feeling that it was later in the day yeah. if you were to look outside during the eclipse time. One of my coworkers brought in eclipse glasses to work, so a few people did go out and look at it and thought it was pretty cool. I abstained because it makes me too nervous. You're afraid. So Sarah yeah. texted me after last episode when I had purchased just like impulse uh eclipse glasses i ended up purchasing like 20 pairs so everyone at my workplace could go out because we mostly work outside be able to to go see it safely and then she texted me an article about how there's a bunch of fake eclipse glasses on the market and i was like i don't know because i did two seconds of an amazon search on it and luckily mine were real glasses so the girls at work double checked for us um so we were able to to go out there and look, and most of the time it was cloudy, which was such a bummer. Ugh. The store was a ghost town because everybody, um, my favorite thing my dad said is they were asking if they could go to somebody's house to plant some shrubs that they had scheduled to get mm -hmm. planted. We just had to give them a date. And they were like, he's like, can we go out? They were like, well, there's an eclipse. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, and? <laughs> so every, like a certain amount of people's life really stopped for for that little bit there and luckily there was a break in the clouds right when we hit our peak Yay. eclipse and it was really it was fun it was just like a an, again we talked about like a moment that we could all kind of like talk about that's not a disaster or political it was just like oh this thing is coming and, and it was a fun little moment I really looking up at the sky it really was well, it may have been sort of anticlimactic here for me. I still really enjoyed the experience of other people enjoying the eclipse. And e even just like watching my coworkers go out and, and look at it was really fun. I had some folks that work with me that listened to the episode talk to me afterwards about animal observations and, and things that they'd seen. But watching friends and family back up north who were in the path of totality and or very close to it. So like my mom was just outside of it. It, it just was so cool watching, seeing the photos that came out of it. Watching People the cheered when it yeah. happened. It was so cute. <laughs> yeah, it really was. And there was some fun animal stuff that I heard that came out of it too. Mostly bird things is what I was hearing about. Just we've talked about before just how accessible birds are. And that's yeah. just an observation that that anyone can make when they go out there. And so my mom had shared with me a post from a bird watching group in Indiana who had his Merlin bird ID like sound recording app going before, during, and after and had, I think it was seven calls that were being identified before the eclipse total silence throughout totality and then like 15 different species of bird identified afterwards which that's just cool it's fun yeah that's that's super neat I feel like when it was happening even though we didn't have totality or anything like that like it felt really quiet 
and it my brain didn't register i thought it was just because there wasn't a lot of people around Mm -hmm. but after it was over i heard the birds singing again and i was like oh yeah you guys were pretty quiet during that time it just felt like the sound got turned off in nature a little bit for just a moment and it was just kind of like like you said felt later in the day but like we were about to leave instead of it being like three so yeah good times yeah Share with us your eclipse experiences. If you've got any nature observations, we'd love to hear about them. But today we're going to be moving to uh, more on the ground rather than in the sky things. We're going to be talking a bit about trees. So Sarah, I was hoping you could tell me about the trees in your neighborhood. Tree cover, maybe types of trees. Is there green space? Is it mostly in people's houses? Yeah, I actually went for a little walk earlier today just up and down my street to kind of confirm that what I was picturing in my head was accurate. And there are trees in my neighborhood, but it does feel pretty sparse. I would say just looking up and down my street, maybe about 70% of the houses have a tree. It's a palm tree, though. Mm -hmm. So it's not, there's not there's not a big canopy. There's not a big canopy, which is what I like <laughs> right. to see. Yeah, so there's not a lot of coverage. But I would say about 70% of the houses have that palm tree, but that's it for most of them. We know I've talked on the podcast before about my other tree. I have this golden rain tree, which is a tree that has a, a little more of uh, a, a top so to it. Yeah. yeah. So Branches, uh, widespread. Yeah. And, and there are what I think are a handful of other houses that I think have that same tree. I'm very bad at my tree identification, but certainly a very similar looking tree. But that's pretty much it. I don't see a ton of variety. There's a handful of other kinds of trees, but mostly we're looking at those palm trees. We've got lots of large shrubbery that people have, but not a whole lot of tree coverage. It was one of the things actually that I didn't like about my neighborhood when I was right. hunting. I'd looked at some houses in some other areas that did have the the live oak trees. If you've driven yeah. around, if you've imagined like the, the South, I think this is what people think of as the, the big, really wide oaks with those really widespread branches. There's Spanish moss hanging from them. It's so pretty. Uh, so I liked going into neighborhoods that did have more of that that tree cover. And so that was initially something that was a little bit of a downer for me about the neighborhood that I ended up in. With the trees that you see there, I've been, uh, because we work with landscaping, we're often re-landscaping people's new houses because builders are bad at landscaping a lot of times <laughs> they they often put in like what's gonna look good when the house sells not necessarily like what's good for the house and the trees in the long term or they're trying to conform to certain specifications from like a township like you must have this certain number of trees even if they're terribly placed or placed too close to the house does it seem like everyone's like palm tree was planted by the builder 100 percent. yes yeah. it's very uniform they're placed at the same distance away from the sidewalk or in the same sort of placement you know not every house is I- yeah. identical they're similar layouts though and so whatever the the structure of that yard is yeah they're pre- placed very similarly yeah there was definitely especially when I was looking specifically, but I think it's fairly obvious to anyone looking that there's a uniformity there. Yeah, I th- think that that's a new thing I'm a little bit fascinated by Um, is like how when they put in new housing, how those tree spaces are thought of, because with all the information we have right now about the benefits of trees, how are we thinking about their placement? Mm-hmm. And so today we're going to talk about who gets to have trees and it is very variable depending on the neighborhood and by the demographics of historically where you might live so stay tuned we're going to be talking about tree equity All right, guys, 
Today, I uh, was thinking about this a lot because of something that we're doing at work. We started this week getting solar panels on our roof. Yay! Which is super exciting. Yeah, I've never been like this intimately involved with actual solar panel installation. So it's cool to be a little bit further in the process. And we've talked a lot to our township about basically our store as a community example of how solar panels can like are accessible and can be put on businesses and like you know any sort of stigma that might be associated with them showing that like hey we've done it successfully and my dad wanted to also partner with potentially donating a tree to be planted in honor of anybody who does get solar on their house and initially he because we work with a lot of parks he was like we could plant it in a park but We also work with a local shelter, and when we went into the neighborhood where the shelter is, there is not a lot of trees. And I thought about how hot it gets in the summertime, and so I've proposed that we focus a little bit more on places that don't get a lot of trees, which then got me thinking, how can I find those places that don't have a lot of trees, and why don't they have a lot of trees? And so that's what this episode is about, is like, why don't we all have the same amount of trees? Go for it, Sarah. Two things to just say about that. You guys do so much cool stuff. That's awesome. I love the solar panels. I love this partnership program idea with the trees. And two, thanks, because this is just a thing that I would not have thought about. So I'm really excited to talk about it. It's easy to take for granted, for sure. You know, trees, we've talked about this before, the idea of plant blindness, Mm -hmm. like not noticing all the vegetation around you. I'm a tree person, so um, my neighborhood, we have, like, the most gorgeous willow tree across the road that, like, makes me cry with how beautiful it is in the wind and a black walnut that messes up all my planting (laughs) in my backyard. So I'm, like, intimately familiar with them. Um, And today we're going to be talking specifically about trees in urban areas versus, like, forests. So if you're interested in in forests, um, Sarah and I have done other episodes about trees before. We did a sustainable forestry episode um, that I really liked really early when we were beginning, but take a look through our back catalog. Today we're talking about specifically urban areas, and trees in these areas have an outside impact on human health since and, and human society in general, we'll talk about in a moment, and a large proportion of humans live in urban areas. So um, they have an outsized impact on on people. We're not going to be focusing as much on the like biodiversity elements of trees and urban spaces because I couldn't necessarily find a lot of papers that had a nexus of these two points. So that feels like its own sort of episode of like urban biodiversity and what types of trees are we using? Yeah. Exactly. This is a little bit more about like, but where are the trees and why are they there? So Sarah, in general, like what are some things you think about about benefits of trees in an area? I mean, I'm going to start with maybe the most superficial, but since you and I have both already talked about it, I I just, I think we have an affinity towards trees. They're pretty. They make us happy. They calm us down. Like I like being in a place that has a lot of trees. I think that it just is a good feeling for us. So I think sort of emotionally or perhaps mental health wise, trees have a benefit for us there. And obviously there's a lot of physical benefits to trees as well. The very air that we are breathing, we can thank trees and other plants for, uh, but taking in that carbon dioxide, giving us oxygen, their roots help prevent soil erosion, their roots help control the water cycle and retain water for us. Shade is a big one, and we're talking about urban trees in particular, too. I think we've talked a little bit about the urban heat island effect. I think so, too. On our cities episode, maybe, but just that elevated temperature that you can find in urban areas with all of that concrete and the impact that trees can have there and keeping us cool, which also has health benefits as well if we can keep the temperature lower in our cities. So, so many things our trees do for us. Yeah, you've definitely touched on a lot of points. There's like the human health elements, there's the aesthetic elements of it, um, which are like not negligible. And there's also environmental differences that also will help mitigate things like climate change. So urban trees help manage stormwater by slowing down the water as it reaches the ground, helping absorb some of it 
transpiration, bringing that water out through its leaves again. It absorbs and blocks air pollution, including particulate matter, which is one of the most dangerous types of air pollution. Sarah covered an episode on air pollution. That's super interesting. Obviously, they provide carbon sequestration. So just like those forests, urban forests also absorb carbon dioxide. They do a really important job of that. It cools the surrounding areas, typically between two and four degrees Fahrenheit, but they have been recorded shading an area to make a 10 degree difference. Yeah. And I, living here in Florida, with the sun beating down on us, totally, I have felt that absolutely the difference that it makes yeah i mean it it definitely also impacts your um, willingness to go outside Mm -hmm. like if you're on a black top or even just an open green space field if it's a hot day you're probably not going out into that open field i lived by our school where we had like the giant fields where they'd have like practice football out there I would want to go under the sycamore trees that were near the sidewalk versus the middle of that field in the summertime. And that actually is associated with better social cohesion. So more people are able to gather with their neighbors in shaded, cooler spaces than they are willing to do so in big open spaces. So trees help us make friends. <laughs> yeah, I I think that's like a totally underrated part. And I'm sure we'll, this has been a, a recent kind of focus in my brain is thinking about social cohesion in the age of the internet and the different ways mm. that that kind of breaks down in our like more technological post-pandemic sort of world. So trees and our local environment do influence how closely connected we feel to our neighbors. Studies have associated the presence of trees with lower rates of crime, improved health incomes, and improved mental health outcomes too. I, what I want to say about these is that a lot of these are correlations, yeah. not necessarily causations. Yeah, I was about to say the the crime rate one made me pause a little bit. I was like, I mean, okay, but also I expect there's a number of factors going Absolutely. on Absolutely. <laughs> and we'll talk about some drawbacks in a moment. There's some other, tr- like different types of trees may increase. Like if you were to causation wise, yeah. um, look at it, could increase crime. Um, the urban and community forest program, which we'll talk about more later in the episode, estimates that urban forests c- contribute $18 billion worth of, worth of ecosystem services a year. Yeah. Again, this is just trees in urban areas. This is not trees overall. Ecosystem services, if you aren't familiar with, are basically things that trees provide that we would have to otherwise potentially pay for. So if you think about like a tree shading a building, offsetting the cost of cooling that building, that's something you don't have to pay for if you have the tree. I have problems with ecosystem services evaluations that we could talk about in a different episode, but that's a, a number if you're if money is important to you in, in the valuation part of it. Some drawbacks about having trees around, I think they should be cited too. Sarah, what yep. can you think of of some issues that having trees around might present? I will say as a homeowner, trees are scary. I want trees yeah. because I do think they're beautiful and they are calming for me and they do help shade your house, which is great. But the previous house that I lived in when I was living in Florida before did have one of those big oak trees out front and I both loved it and was terrified by it because you think of things like branches. Anytime there was any type of high winds, I was just so anxious that something was going to come down on my house and they're expensive to to care for. I probably didn't maintain it like I was supposed to because of the costs associated with tree trimming. So there's things like that. It was a large tree growing close to your house and you think about the root system as that tree develops, maybe potentially causing problems with your driveway or your foundation uh, in a worst case scenario. So you definitely think about those types of things you are currently experiencing some drawbacks to trees as well with allergy season. That can be really difficult for some people that have really strong allergies that can really take a, take a toll on folks as well. So there definitely are some tree challenges. Yeah, I don't want to exclusively, um, you know, I don't want to sweep those under the rug. I do remember like 10 years ago, 
a local contractor put an opinion piece in our local paper about how trees are bad, actually. And oh no, he, I, I thought it was really funny because I'm not sure who's on his side on this one. Like, who's like, trees, bad. Um, I mean, my brother has... <laughs> He's an anti-tree person. He does not want trees around his house because of some of the things that I mentioned. They are tough. They are a maintenance thing. I am of the opinion that I still want the trees, but I do get really anxious about them. Like, I want to make sure I've done my homework and I know the type of tree and how far it is and all of that. So I do get nervous about them, but the benefits of trees vastly outweigh those, those costs for me. Totally. Right tree, right place is a really important element of that. Um, But yeah, you have to worry about potential increased costs, maintenance of the tree. If under stress, some studies have shown that trees can actually potentially emit some pollution like VOCs. What? Yeah, they looked at, I think it was the emerald ash borer that they were specifically looking at Mm. trees that were under that. It was either that or Dutch elm disease. But basically the trees might have been putting out stress hormones basically to other trees and that has VOCs in it. Um, Smaller trees that have like disrupted the overall view might have an association with increased Increased crime. crime. (laughs) Tree crime. (laughs) (laughs) They said basically tall trees where you can see things, but they shade places. Good. Not less crime. Short trees might be able to hide behind more crime. Um, Again, (laughs) All these individual studies, associations, not causations. And then green infrastructure, like if you add more trees to an area, can actually contribute to gentrification, which is um, a process that can exclude certain types of people from neighborhoods where they could historically afford to live. But that is kind of a mixed bag because you're improving conditions, but those improved conditions can price some people out so it's an interesting kind of mixed bag overall i'm very pro tree if you can't tell (laughs) but i don't want to to say that like my stuffy nose if this was a trigger also for my asthma i might have some other opinions about spring we we like trees trees are not the perf Perfect. That's a weird thing to say. But <laughs> trees are perfect just the way they are. <laughs> the trees are perfect just the way they are. But there are some things that you have to deal with that come along yeah, with totally. them. Side note, we're doing an episode at some point on tree slash plant communication because yes, amazing. absolutely. So cool. Trees are cool. Um, Yeah, we're not even getting into that. And we also haven't gotten anywhere into what sort of wildlife benefits that Mm -hmm. these urban trees have, too. So just putting it out there. We're nature podcasts, but uh, today humans are part of nature. We always want to remind you to do that. Um, So trees, overall, I'm very pro-tree, but who has access to them isn't equal. Areas where more people live in poverty, in one study, there's actually a lot of studies who have covered these different impacts of where the trees are. Where more people lived in poverty, there are about 23% tree cover as compared to 43% tree cover in wealthier areas. So that's a pretty significant difference. And some of the poorest areas of the country, there is tree coverage that is less than 5% of the total Mm -hmm. areas. So actually one of the opinion pieces in the New York Times that showed some of this data actually showed Philadelphia. And it was interesting because it showed the neighborhood where my mom worked and she works for fancy people. They had like, when you looked at the overall map, you could see the green. And then they went, you know, five miles away to a neighborhood where you could just see the the concrete, like just the amount of paved area without the tree cover. And they had only 5%. So why? This doesn't just have to do with poverty. It actually has to do with some historical factors, including redlining. So Sarah, are you familiar with redlining? Yes. Whether I can explain it coherently (laughs) will be another factor. But yeah, this was a practice that started kind of after the depression. So Mm -hmm. like in the 30s and has to do with who banks would lend money to basically. And the U.S. government created these maps that they designated their quote good and not good places to lend money to and so the good ones were in green the quote bad ones were in red 
and this was basically decided by race. So those white neighborhoods were deemed safe to loan to, and the areas shaded in red, hence redlining, were deemed not safe to lend money to, were areas were black communities, basically. Not just black. It does get talked about mostly with yeah. black neighborhoods, but non-white people were considered, these areas were considered not safe to lend money to, and so basically could not get a conventional mortgage. So they couldn't buy uh, or refinance their homes, and that is something that we still certainly see lots of effects of today. Yeah, redlining is like, absurdly impactful to today's society. <laughs> this, as Sarah mentioned, I'm going to go a little bit more into detail, but that was a very good explanation of what redlining <laughs> is. You did it. I'm proud of you. <laughs> um, Yes, it started in the wake of the Depression. A lot of people had issues. There was a mortgage crisis. People weren't able to afford their homes. The U.S. government stepped in um, and started the Homeowners Loan Corporation to help people get loans through the government. The corporation assessed housing stock based on two things, the types of homes, so the age, the structure, etc. But it was largely dependent on the demographics of the area. There were th four different rankings that they could be categorized into. Category A was the yeah le least risky investment, the, the most likely that someone's going to successfully pay back their mortgage if you were to loan them the money. And it was primarily where white people, often young white people lived. It was associated with some newer housing stock. But when you control for these factors, white people. B would be like a slightly less or a safe investment, a slightly more risky. C, they start associating it more with people of color, of brown, black uh, immigration, that sort of population. And then D was a lot higher percentage Black people living in these neighborhoods. Again, conditions of housing could also be factored in there. And when I was reading some of the studies, it wasn't... Basically, they worked with local municipalities to identify these different neighborhoods. And so there is some uh, wiggle across the country on how impactful it was in mm -hmm. one particular area. But you have to think about who had the power in the 1930s, it was going to be the people drawing the maps were primarily going to be white people. And it was widespread practice and pretty consistent across the board, the impacts. So that even though there might be variability city to city, um, this is basically how it was done from the 1930s to the 1960s. So if you can think about that in your family, like that is my grandparents' generation. Mm -hmm. Um, when they were trying to buy houses. So taking a look, quoting one of the articles, and all the articles are down in the show notes, although this is by no means a comprehensive look at redlining. If you are interested at all in this subject, there is so much information out there, and there is, I highly recommend looking more and more into it. This is just sort of a brief picture. Um, one of the articles says, for instance, between, uh, basically this impacted, it wasn't just categorizing the loans, it was who got the money. It wasn't just like, oh, we have to assume that if we invest in this neighborhood that we might not get paid back. It was, we're not going to give Don't, you money. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, for instance, between 1934 and 1962, the FHA and the Veterans Administration lent over $120 billion for new housing. And 98% of this money was distributed to white residents compared to 2% of African Americans and other people of color. During this period, African Americans represented about 10% of the U.S. population. So it's not just that there are less people of color than there are white people in the United States, proportionately not provided with the same sort of money. Studies in Houston and Boston show that even when controlling for income, whites were nearly three times as likely to receive a mortgage loan. Yeah, so it wasn't just about the wealth, even wealthier right. Black neighborhoods were deemed not safe. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's like a really easy conflation to make. And it's something that I found su initially surprising in college, how consistently studies showed that like it's not just about low income people. If you are low income and you can say, well, of course, historically, 
Black people and people of color were marginalized and were less likely to have money to begin with. And therefore, they're sort of set up that way. It was like, no, (laughs) this explicitly had to do with their race. And the impacts of redlining persist to this day. So it became illegal under the Fair Housing Act in 1968 to consider race as any part of the lending process, national origin, the other sort of discrimination policies. You can discriminate based on like somebody's discriminate as in be choosy based on um, someone's like personal history of being able to pay a loan back, but you can't be like, they're a person of color and therefore it's more risky. So I'm Mm -hmm. going to give them a different rate or I'm going to not lend them the money. But the impacts of this persist today. At the time, if if you weren't able to get the conventional mortgage, it doesn't mean you weren't necessarily going to get a house at all. You could pursue other avenues, but you were more likely to have a higher interest rate or get a predatory loan that was harder to be able to pay back. I'm an adult now, and I feel like I have a slightly better handle on how my overall financial picture is sort of influenced by all these little things. I don't know if you feel like this, Sarah, that you're like, okay, all of it's coming from the same pot of money. So if I get sick, that comes out of the same pot of money that my mortgage has to come out of. If, you know, when we had a baby, all of that's coming out of the same thing. We have a home repair. It all impacts each other, right? Like there, there's all of these things going on at the same time. And then when you have that, so now maybe you have a higher mortgage rate, you have less money to be able to buy healthy food for yourself, to be able to pursue um, more preventative health care versus emergency health care. All of these things tie into each other. To upkeep the house that you are living in. Right. Yeah, absolutely. To be able to even relocate out of your house Mm -hmm. to a different place to get a better job. Like all of these things tie into themselves and are self-limiting. So places that were redlined today have higher pollution rates than places that weren't part of that red category, that category D. Um, They have higher instances of having factories and oil wells and things like that in their area. And they have higher rates of things like asthma and health issues. So this association that we were talking about earlier about like trees being associated with certain health incomes or outcomes and certain um, societal outcomes, if they're associated with it and they're associated with redlining, we have kind of this like mirror correlation here where areas that were redlined have less trees and areas that are redlined also have these lower health outcomes and other persistent inequality problems. Yeah. And this is part of it, me is still like trying to connect all of this in my brain and sort of what the cause effect pathway yeah. is there. But areas that are redlined are are just there's we're not getting any investment. And I don't mean that necessarily like bank investment, but like right social services yeah, investments. Yeah. yeah. And so I think all of these things are are kind of tied up together where if there's no investment in this community, this community has been deemed a high risk place. That's where things like those factories are going to end up. And certainly nobody's spending any extra money to put, you know, this, either the city or the homeowners aren't putting any extra money into things like tree planting efforts in right. the neighborhood. So um, it is all connected. And I don't know if this was one of the things, Casey, that you came across when you were research- researching or not, but there was an NPR article that I was reading that was about the health effects of redlining that are persistent today. And they actually show uh, an area where they're showing how the red line sort of maps were drawn and what the high and low risk areas were. And then they have this thing called their social vulnerability index, which they describe as a measure of the community's capacity to prepare for, respond to, and recover from human and natural disasters. And just the correlation between those two maps is is eye-opening to see. So there's there's just definitely a, a relationship there. Absolutely. So we're talking about like these historical causes. And then you think about over time, all of these things compound upon each other, money and power and health and 
just your ability to be able to be resilient in these these face of different challenges that we all might be impacted by, but our ability to then absorb that impact and and come back from is impacted by our resources. So it became illegal in 1968. That doesn't mean that there weren't people still sort of thinking about these practices while doing loans. There are stories of you know, people, I believe it was Senator Cory Booker who um, talked about like his parents trying to get a house and basically finding these discrimination practices were still being put into place even after it became illegal. So at this point, there was, you know, something you could do about it, but it doesn't mean that it like hardline ended um, in 1968. And lest you think this is, it exclusively impacts the South, the Northeast actually has the worst disparities. Um, in a study conducted by the Nature Conservancy, high-income areas had 30% more tree cover than low-income blocks and were four degrees cooler mm. than those areas. So again, that, those correlations, we I think that's an easy causation one. Tree, shade, cooler. <laughs> um, they noted that there was a strong correlation between tree cover and the presence of non-Hispanic white people. Overall, they estimated that translates to high-income blocks having 62 million more trees than low-income blocks. It's also important to note that about 60% of areas that were redlined are still mostly people of color. So there's all of this enmeshed together. This is where the concept of environmental justice kind of comes in as a side note. Um, Environmental justice is that intersection between where we have environmental problems and we have disparity based on things like race or in other cases, things like um, the presence of disabilities, basically how environmental issues impact marginalized groups in a greater way than they do other parts of the population. So take a look at your neighborhood around you thinking in that context, you know, what is the demographics of your neighborhood? How new is your neighborhood? Like how recently was it built? They are proposing. I also this actually has been a big week for me, Sarah. In addition to solar, I went to my first like city council meeting this what? week. Look yes. at you! I know. Past I'm checking challenge off a little. completer. Yes. Um. So they're looking on building. We have the state hospital adjacent to our house. Um. They're they've sold the land for redevelopment to add housing, and all the residents have a lot of feelings about it because of things like. How is this new area going to be equitable to access for different people? Like, what what sort of housing situation is it going to be? And so I also have to issue with stormwater because we have lots of uh, flooding in our area. Yeah. Um, but I was able to go to this meeting and actually bring up things like light pollution and because they're going to put a grocery store there so how are we considering light pollution and impacts on the neighborhood and wildlife they're going to put an hoa which one of the people in my neighborhood brought up have also historical racial implications as well they've been used to exclude different types of people from the the neighborhood they're planning on putting an hoa i also brought up that hoas oftentimes have environmentally unfriendly practices in the name of aesthetics and so i was able to go in here and i i feel like um so we, we went and it was the planning commission and at the end they were like you know we don't normally have this many people at the planning commission meetings normally they go to the city council meeting and they're actually the ones who are making the decision well nobody in that room knew that we had just all gotten a letter saying hey we're gonna be doing stuff so why don't you you know come and give your opinion well then thinking like i was able to go that day because it was the day andrew was off and he would be home to make sure that our daughter had somebody at home so then i could go to that meeting again another thing where like if you are someone who has less means, if you don't have transportation to get there, if you mm-hmm. don't have um, support to be able to look after your kids, you work a late shift, things like that, you're not going to be able to to exercise your power. Um, and again, these things just keep com- being compounded on each other because of this unequal a- access that really has been set historically. It's not to say that history dictates where we are today, but it certainly impacts, impacts it. Yeah. So that's kind of how trees are are spread out across our our urban areas, specifically in the United States, based on this these historical policies. However, according to the Nature Conservancy, although I have seen this disputed in some other places, urban trees, 
no matter where you live in the urban area, are on the decline overall, which tracks in the town where my dad lives. They have a bunch of really old oak trees that they're starting to take down because they're messy, because they're dropping branches. So this is attributed, according to the Nature Conservancy, largely due to disinvestment in them. So for a while, we were putting a lot of money into them, and the amount of money per person that we're putting into our trees in our municipal budgets have dropped. And so they have attributed this to the lack of consideration of the impacts of trees in a neighborhood. And I wonder if you have trees in your neighborhood, if you sort of, again, get that plant blindness and you take them for granted. So you you don't want to pay people to maintain these trees. Yes. They're a tree. I think part of the problem with that, and I've talked about this before with environmental things, but I think a lot of the benefits of trees are invisible to us. Yeah. We know they happen. We know that trees produce oxygen, but we can't really see it. And we take the air that we breathe for granted. And therefore we take the thing that is helping to give us good air to breathe. We take that for granted. We don't understand how that roots, or even if we understand it, we can't see how those roots are helping our soil and water. And we cannot really conceive of what would change if the trees were gone, I think, mentally. I think that's the problem for people. And so we say these trees are not worth the trouble because we don't really think about their worth. Right. And we can see the problems. We can yes. see the falling of branches. Um, their concerns, another element is they brought up was concerned about untended parks becoming areas of crime. Trees and crime. Maybe its own episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is hope. There are many organizations, both nonprofit and government organizations, that are focused on this particular issue. Um, and one resource I found particularly interesting is an organization called American Forests, and they have a tree equity program. And so it's specifically for addressing tree canopy cover inequality. And Sarah, I have a link here. Will you please get into this link? Yes. And take a look. I think it links you directly to my neighborhood, but you can zoom out and you can find your own. There's actually a search bar. On yes, the I got it. Side. I'm putting in my zip code here. This is fascinating. Super cool. And once you get there, tell me what you see. Okay. I am zooming in on my neighborhood. I see a lot of orange around me. Okay. But let me try to find my specific neighborhood. Okay. I don't know how much you want me to, to s describe this, Casey, but I'm in an area that's basically all shaded orange, which... Okay. If you is... hover over your neighborhood... Okay. Oh, I see. It gives me my yeah. score. I have a tree equity score of 68. Oh, that's bad, girl. <laughs> in my neighborhood. I told you. Yeah, Not that's a bad. lot of tree coverage. Um, uh, what is your priority? Wow, my current can canopy cover is only twenty six percent, and we I am its highest priority. Okay. Do you see any of the score indicators? Anything that jumps out at you? Well, I'm not sure. I need to spend some time on this, so I'm not sure exactly what I'm looking at, but. There's something called a linguistic isolation that's at 28%, people of color, 49%. So for the people who are listening, because this is an audio medium and I'm having Sarah describe a visual <laughs> map to me. Um, With things I don't quite understand yet. So. Yes. So this is a, um, it's a map of the U.S. and it is overlaid with census blocks. So they have split everything into what their census block is. And the census gives you a certain amount of information about who lives in that area. So for mine, it it lists things like people of color, the people in poverty, um, mm -hmm. the children and seniors in the area, mm -hmm. the health burden index. I don't know enough about each of these indicators to know exactly what yeah. each means. That's going to be part of my homework is to look more into it. And then it is overlaid with, you said yours are orange because you got a... a Pretty bad score compared to some of the areas around me. I think the lowest area in my town is 73. But I live in the Northeast and yeah. we are historically forest rather than savanna. Sure. And yeah, I am not surprised just based on the things that we talk about. I live yeah. in a neighborhood that's a little bit older. That is a high percentage of Hispanic 
folks in my neighborhood and a lot of people that speak primarily Spanish. And um, yeah, it does. It's sort of anger inducing <laughs> to see the score, but I am not surprised by it. Yeah, mine's 85 and my priority is moderate. So our, it gives you your current canopy cover, which is 30%. And I believe from all of them, not all of them, in some of the, most of the areas that are like super urbanized, like um, our city center around downtown, they're looking for a canopy cover goal of about 30%. Whereas you move out a little bit from the town center, we're closer to like mine's 50%, but across the street from us is a different census block and that is 40%. So they have come up with your tree equity score, I think, based upon um, some of these different factors of who lives in your neighborhood and then how much tree cover you have. Mm -hmm. And if you're super green on the map, then you've got pretty good tree equity. So um, in one part of our town, the highest part, they have a tree equity of 98 so can I read their uh so if you look at what their priority indexing is, if there's a little question mark there and it says the priority index is made up of equally weighted climate and socioeconomic characteristics that are integrated into the tree equity score. A higher priority index indicates more at risk population. And then it for more information on each of those indicators, those things that we mentioned. Uh, they have a data glossary that you can look at or some other tools that we'll explore. I found this to be extremely helpful. I thought that this was a really interesting way to really see your particular community and how much actual tree cover you have. So you can kind of think about what you perceive your tree cover to be and then what they have it classified as. And you can learn a little bit about the neighborhood around you. This I find just so interesting and there's so many depths to mine within it so Sarah what did you think of this this map so cool I mean like I said it tracks very well with sort of what I had in my head first from what I was seeing with the trees in my neighborhood and the things that we talked about but yeah this I love that this exists and I right? cannot wait to look at it more this I'm sorry did you say this was from that it's American from American Forest. Forest. Or, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm excited to look at the map more and to learn more about that organization. So if you live in a spot that's like super orange like Sarah, there's some bright spots ahead. The Inflation Reduction Act, which we've talked a lot about because it ends up intersecting with a lot of our episodes recently. So that was the climate change bill that was um, enacted. It allocates $1.5 billion towards urban and community forestry program, which is a government program that is under the U.S. Forest Service, which weirdly falls under the USDA. So that doesn't fall under like national parks. <laughs> it falls under the U.S. Department of Agriculture, probably because forestry is a crop. But yeah, they have the Urban and Community Forestry Program. And so they've allocated them $1.5 billion to then allocate grants out to different organizations trying to address this tree inequity pro problem. So when they're actually implementing this, I, I looked at a couple things that talked about organizations who are working on this. They tried to look at, okay, are we like forcing trees on people who don't want them? Because as we've mentioned, there are drawbacks to trees. And so is it partially that people who are low income are averse to trees? Um, and they actually found in the one study that they did here, the did it in Kentucky with a group called Louisville Grows, who is dedicated to planting trees in Louisville. And uh, they surveyed a bunch of the residents there, and they found that income levels don't actually correlate with someone's willingness to get a tree planted on their property. Historically, a lot of these programs have focused on public spaces, but to get trees to the people who need it most, you do need to be able to plant some trees in residential properties. Instead of income levels... Other things that could be kind of associated potentially with income levels but have been isolated in this study include the lot size and the home value mm -hmm. and the current level of tree cover within the neighborhood. So if you already had trees in your neighborhood, you are more likely to want a tree on your property than if you don't already have a lot of trees. I don't know if that's a 
I am used to it or I my neighbors have it and therefore like socially there's some sort of connection to other people in the neighborhood because you know your neighbor paints their house maybe you want to paint your house that sort of deal I think it's just that trees are pretty and so when trees, you see trees are yeah <laughs> yeah maybe if they're proximity wise close to you you're more like yeah I want that close to me um the nonprofit that was involved, the Louisville Grows nonprofit, um, they noted that initially the acceptance of working within these communities of people they offered trees to plant in their yard was about 10% of people accepted the trees planted in their yard. But they've worked in the city for over a decade and they've built a lot of trust with the residents in these impacted areas. And they've noted that acceptance rates have now risen closer to 30 to 40 percent of people that they offer trees to. So this is a, a process. This is not something that we can like go and say the government is going to plant a tree on everyone's yard. <laughs> And Whether I mean, you like it or not, go for it. Right. You can't do that. And also, I mean, you just mentioned lot size, and that is actually, yeah. a, you know, this is not necessarily true, but certainly if you have a less expensive house, it probably has a smaller lot. Not yeah. always, but there are some yards where it might just be really difficult to find a tree that's going to fit in the space that you have. Yeah. I And I also try to cross-search this grant with anything to do with, like, and the trees should be native or something like yeah. that. And I found no sort yeah. of like implementation of what tree it should be. Um, obviously, we don't want invasive species planted in towns, but there are so many considerations when it comes to city trees. A lot of these areas, as we noted, are really hot. So you need a tree that's going to be really resilient to pavement being around them. Air pollution, as much as trees can help with air pollution they can also die because of air pollution so you need something that's hardy with a lot of the emissions from cars coming you need ones that are going to tolerate uh road salt coming into their patch of land you want something that's not going to drop a bunch of nuts on the ground all of these factors are all going to be in there as well as any sort of local initiative trying to get things like native trees in involved in this. And the more biodiversity that we have along tree streets can help as well, because when you do have things like the emerald ash borer, ash trees historically mm -hmm. were a big street tree, and when you have the emerald ash borer come through now- they all died. They all died at the same time. So then you lose a huge amount of canopy all at the same time, and just trying to replace them with younger trees doesn't quite work. So there's a lot of- considerations on what type of trees that they should be putting in there but uh that is most of what i got about who gets trees thanks so much that like i said earlier was not a topic that i would have ever thought about and it is so interesting and i really want to go plant a tree now <laughs> I'm, I'm very very um high on trees right now so <laughs> stick around we will have your challenge for the episode coming All right, guys, it is the challenge of the week. If this is your first episode, every time that we have an episode, which is not weekly anymore, it's bi-weekly. <laughs> so challenge of the episode, um, we try and give you guys a challenge, a take home sort of thing that you can do based on today's topic. So a couple things that you can do. Uh, first, you should go to www.treeequityscore.org and you should look at the map. And Definitely. find your neighborhood. Fascinating. Really gives you kind of some perspective about um, not just like your neighborhood, but your neighborhood in relation to other parts of your town, people who live around you. Highly recommend that one. You can just sit on your phone or at your desk and do. You don't even have to go outside. Um, you can also visit the urban and community forestry program. I don't know why that one doesn't roll off the tongue for me, but <laughs> um, they have listed all of their grants that they gave out in 2023. And so you can see specifically where a bunch of that money went. And a lot of places are getting like a million dollars towards tree planting. Some of these are city governments, but others are nonprofits 
who are working to plant trees. And through this grant, they really prioritize places that have been underserved through the Justice 40 initiative, which means 40% of the funds are aimed to go towards underserved populations. So if you take a look there, you might find that your city have gotten a grant. And from there, you can dive deeper. You can potentially participate by volunteering in this program, by putting your input. If you go to your local you know, city planning meetings, You can provide input about your priorities, like whether or not you would like to see some of these trees be native, if it's possible, thrown in there. Um, These are all things that you can start to get involved in, whether it's physically planting the tree or it's something like influencing some of the policy. But just getting to know where you're at in the first place, I think, is the priority. So, Do you have a link, Casey, to where they can go to look up if they received a grant? I will make sure it's in the show notes. Beautiful. So, Sarah, that's my challenge for the week. Um, And also, if you guys are interested in the impacts of redlining, please do more research. This is a very small glimpse into all the impacts that are from that. I am sure there are a lot of better resources, even than the ones that I'm citing here. So um, go down that rabbit hole. It's very much worth it. And it might give you a new perspective on why things are the way they are it's always worth asking the question instead of taking it for granted so that is my homework for the week sarah if they want to give us updates on homework or give us input or feedback or any other things where can they do that best places to find us right now are on facebook or at a little greener podcast or you can send us an email at any time at a little greener podcast at gmail.com. And we always love hearing from you. And Casey, thanks so much. Thanks for bringing that topic to our attention. This was a really cool episode. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for all of your input, Sarah. Um, I hope that your tree equity score goes up in the next year as the city of Orlando is one of the places that got the grants. So uh, yeah, we look I forward live outside to of the city of Orlando. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, Florida. All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.